In this video, we study the network simplex algorithm, which is essentially the primal simplex method specialized to our network flow problem. In particular, we are going to study the uncapacitated network flow problem, which we saw can be formulated as the problem of minimizing C transposed F subject to AF equal to B and F greater than or equal to zero. In this formulation, A is the node arc incidence matrix of our directed graph. As we have already discussed, this is a linear programming problem in standard form. Therefore, we could simply use the simplex method or the dual simplex method that we've already studied in chapter 3. The reason we're going to study the network simplex algorithm is that this algorithm runs an order of magnitude faster than a general purpose simplex method applied to a network flow problem. For this reason, the network simplex algorithm is widely used in practice, and it is included in many commercial optimization codes because it's simple and efficient. Part of the notation in our linear programming problem in standard form is different from what we used in chapter 3. The first difference is that our vector of variables is f instead of x, and the second difference is that the role of n and m here is switched. In fact, our matrix A has n rows and m columns. Therefore, we have n equality constraints and m flow variables. Of course, having to switch n and m with respect to what we've done so far is unfortunate. However, the reason we do that is to have in our graph n nodes and m arcs, which is standard from a graph theory perspective. Throughout this video, we will always keep the following assumption. First, we assume that the sum of all the supplies is equal to zero. We've already discussed how this assumption is natural because otherwise the problem is infeasible. Secondly, we assume that the graph G is connected. Also, this assumption can be made without loss of generality. This is because if the graph is not connected, then our problem can be simply decomposed into the connected components of G. Essentially, you can solve separately the subproblems over the connected components, and putting together the solutions obtained, you can obtain a solution to the original problem. One key assumption that we had in Chapter 3 and we don't have so far for our network flow problem is that the row of the matrix A are linearly independent. In fact, we've already seen how the rows of the matrix A sum to the zero vector, so they are linearly dependent. Using this fact, together with the assumption that we have just discussed, we obtain that the flow conservation constraint at any node coincides with the sum of the flow conservation constraints at all the other nodes. This means that any one of the flow conservation constraints is redundant and so it can be removed from our constraints while maintaining the same feasible set. Since we can choose any flow conservation constraint, we choose the last one, which is the flow conservation at node n. In order to throw away the flow conservation constraint at node n, we define a new constraint matrix for our problem, which is essentially obtained by throwing away the last row of our previous constraint matrix. Formally, we define the truncated node arc incidence matrix A tilde to be the matrix with n minus 1 rows and m columns, which consists of the first n minus 1 rows of the matrix A. Now let's stop for a minute to understand the structure of A tilde. Every column of A tilde corresponds to an arc of our directed graph. The arc can be of the form i n for some i, or of the form n i for some i, or it doesn't contain a node n at all. Let's consider the first case where the column corresponds to an arc i n. Then in the original matrix A, we had a 1 in the ith row and a minus 1 in the nth row. So now in A tilde we have only one non-zero entry equal to 1 at the ith row. Vice versa, if the column corresponds to an arc ni, we obtain that A tilde has a single non-zero entry which is equal to minus 1 and it is in the ith row. In the remaining case, 
where the arc doesn't contain node n, the corresponding column of a tilde still has two non-zero entries, a 1 corresponding to the tail and a minus 1 corresponding to the head. Similarly, we define the vector b tilde obtained from the vector b by throwing away the nth component, which is the last component. With our new matrix a tilde and our new vector b tilde, we are finally able to write down in matrix form the system obtained from AF equal to B by discarding the last equation. In fact, this system is exactly A tilde F equal to B tilde. The reason why we discarded the last equation of AF equal to B was that the rows of A were not linearly independent. Shortly, we will see that now the rows of A tilde are linearly independent. This fact will allow us to apply to this problem all the knowledge and constructions that we applied in chapter 3 to obtain the primal simplex method. Before proceeding, let's see a very simple example. We have here our node arc incidence matrix A that we saw in example 7.1. Below, we have the new matrix A tilde, which is simply obtained from A by discarding the last row. As you can see, the columns of A tilde are still indexed by the arcs of our directed graph. On the other hand, the rows are still indexed by our nodes, but now the last node, n equal to 5, is missing. We know very well that the matrix A has linearly dependent rows, because summing the entries in every column gives you a 0, and you can now check that in this example A tilde has full rank so all its rows are linearly independent. Our next target is to study the basic feasible solution to our problem. In particular, we will see how they essentially correspond to trees in our directed graph. Let's start by giving the definition of a tree solution and of a feasible tree solution. Later on, we will see how these two concepts correspond to the concepts of basic solution and of basic feasible solution. A flow vector f is called a tree solution if it can be constructed by the following procedure. a. Pick a subset t of n-1 arcs that form a tree when their direction is ignored. b. Let fij equal to 0 for every arc ij not in t. c. Use the flow conservation equation a tilde f equal to b tilde to determine the flow variables fij for all the remaining arcs, which are the arcs ij in t. Now a feasible tree solution is a tree solution that also satisfies f greater than or equal to zero. Notice that at this point it's unclear that point c can be performed at all. So the next thing that I want to do is to see how step C can be performed using a very specific procedure described here. First, we call the node n the root of the tree. Then we use the flow conservation equations to determine the flows on the arcs incident to the leaves of our tree. And then we continue by proceeding from the leaves towards the root. Now this procedure is admittedly still not very clear. What is clear though is that leaves must exist from our theorem 7.1a. To better understand how this procedure works, let's see an example. On the left we have a picture of our network. Our nodes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, so we have n equal to 8. Our set T of arcs is given by the arcs that are hatched in the picture. So these are the arcs 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 3, 8, 8, 6, 5, 6, and 6, 7. Then in the picture we have these strange double arrows, and these represent the supply on the nodes. For example, the supply in node 5 is equal to 1. Graphically, this makes sense, because the double arrow indicates that one unit of flow enters the network from the outside. As you can see, in node 6, we instead have a double arrow leaving node 6. So in this case, it means that we have a demand of 2 in node 6. In other words, our supply is minus 2. 
following our definition 7.1, we set the arc flows outside of the tree to be zero. This means that the flow will be zero for the arcs 1, 4, 2, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 7. Next, we need to determine the remaining arc flows using our systematic procedure. The node n equal to 8 is our root, and visually a root is placed at the top of our directed graph. Essentially, you can think that you're hanging your directed graph holding it on the root. Now we need to look at a leaf of our tree. One such leaf is node 1. Our procedure then tells us to determine the flow on the arc incident to node 1 by using the flow conservation constraint. We have two units of flow entering 1, so we need to have two units of flow leaving 1. So the flow in the arc 1, 2 is set to 2, and we write it down next to the arc. Another leaf of our tree is node 4. Here we have two units of flow entering 4, and so we need to have also here two units of flow leaving 4 along the arc 4, 3. So we write down 2 next to the arc 4, 3. Another leaf is node 5. Here we have one unit of flow entering from the outside, so we need to have one unit of flow leaving node 5 through arc 5-6. So we write down 1 next to our arc 5-6. The only remaining leaf is the node 7. In this case we have no flow entering and no flow leaving. So the flow on arc 6-7 should be equal to 0. So we write a 0 next to the arc 6-7. We are now done with all the leaves of our tree, and the systematic procedure tells me to proceed from the leaves towards the root. So we can now look, for example, at node 2. Essentially, what you need to do is to select a leaf of the new tree obtained from the old one by removing all the nodes that you have already considered. In our case, at this point of the procedure, we have already considered the nodes 1, 4, 5, and 7. So let's look at node 2. We have two units of flow entering, so along the arc 2, 3, we need to have two units of flow. So we write down a 2 next to the arc 2, 3. Now let's, for example, look at the node 3. In node 3, we have two units of flow leaving the network, then two units of flow entering from node 2, and two more units of flow entering from node 4. So in total we have four units of flow entering and two units of flow leaving. So to satisfy our flow conservation constraint on node 3, we need to have two units of flow leaving node 3 along the arc 3-8. So we write down a 2 on the arc 3-8. Finally we consider node 6. Here we have two units of flow leaving the network and one unit of flow entering from node 5. Therefore we need to have one unit of flow entering node 6 along the arc 8-6. So we write down a 1 next to the arc 8-6. At this point we have obtained our tree solution. We also observe that all the components of the flow are greater than or equal to 0 Therefore, our tree solution is also a feasible tree solution. The next theorem shows that the procedure that we just described makes sense. In other words, once a tree is fixed, then a corresponding tree solution is uniquely determined and we can obtain it with our procedure. Let's read the formal statement in theorem 7.3. Let t be a subset of n-1 arcs that form a tree when their direction is ignored. Then the system of linear equation a tilde f equal to b tilde, together with fij equal to zero for every ij not in t, has a unique solution. I'm going to leave the proof of this theorem to you as an exercise, but I want to explain to you an idea that you can use to write down the full proof. The idea is to construct the submatrix b of a tilde that consists only of the columns that correspond to the arcs of t. In our example, the arcs of t were 1, 2, 4, 3, 5, 6, 6, 7, 2, 3, 3, 8, and 8, 6. So I write these labels here 
to keep track of the columns of B. Of course, the number of rows of B is the same as the number of rows of A tilde. So the rows will be indexed by all the nodes except for the last one. In our case, all the nodes from 1 to 7. As you can see here, my rows have been permuted. In fact, in our matrix B, I want to reorder the rows and the columns according to the order used in our systematic procedure. If you remember, in our previous example, we first considered node 1 and the corresponding arc 1, 2. This is why my first row corresponds to node 1 and my first column corresponds to the arc 1, 2. Next, we consider node 4 and the arc 4, 3. Correspondingly, my second row corresponds to node 4 and my second column to arc 4, 3. And so on and so forth, if you remember, the last node we considered was 6, together with arc 8, 6. In fact, my last row corresponds to node 6 and my last column corresponds to the arc 8, 6. Using the special order of the rows and of the columns, we see that the matrix B has a very special structure. Let's see the structure in this specific example. The arc 1, 2 has tail 1 and head 2. Therefore, I will have a 1 corresponding to node 1 and a minus 1 corresponding to node 2. Next, my arc 4, 3 has a 1 corresponding to the tail 4 and a minus 1 corresponding to the head 3. Then the arc 5, 6 has a tail in node 5 and a head in node 6. Arc 6, 7 has a tail in node 6 and a head in node 7. Arc 2, 3 has a tail in node 2 and a head in node 3. Arc 3, 8 has a tail in node 3 and a head in node 8. Recall that there is no row corresponding to node 8 and so this column has only one non-zero. Finally, arc 8, 6 has a tail in node 8 and a head in node 6. Now the structure of this matrix is clear in this example. On the diagonal we have only plus minus 1 entries and above the diagonal we have all 0 entries. This implies that the determinant of the matrix B is either 1 or minus 1, hence it is invertible. And this is everything we need to show to prove the theorem. In fact, if you look at the system of linear equation a tilde f equal to b tilde and substitute fij equal to 0 for all ij not in t, we are left with a system of equations with constraint matrix B. And since B is invertible, such a system has a unique solution. But now let's get back to our matrix B and let's understand a little bit better why it has this specific structure. The first thing that we should understand is why in the diagonal we always have a plus or minus 1. This is because at every iteration of our procedure, we always consider a specific node of our tree together with an arc that is incident to that node. In our example, in the first iteration, we consider arc 1, 2 with node 1. Therefore, the entry in position 1, 1 is either plus 1 or minus 1. In the second iteration, we consider arc 4, 3 together with node 4. Therefore, the entry in position 2, 2 of our matrix is plus 1 or minus 1. And so on and so forth, you obtain that all the entries in the diagonal will be plus 1 or minus 1. So the last thing we need to understand is why all the entries above the diagonal are zeros. This is because in our procedure, at every iteration, we consider a node that is a leaf of the directed graph obtained by removing all the nodes that we already considered. Therefore, the arc that we consider at iteration i cannot be incident to any node that we considered in the previous iterations i-1, i-2, until 1. Let's consider, for example, the second iteration where we consider arc 4, 3 and node 4. Due to our procedure, we have that the node 4 is a leaf of the tree obtained from the original one by discarding node 1. So then the arc 4, 3 is an arc of this new tree. And so neither its tail nor its head can be the node 1. And this is why we have a 0 in the column corresponding to 4, 3 and in the row corresponding to node 1. 
This completes the proof idea. Once again, this is not a complete proof, but all the arguments that we discussed can be easily extended to the general case, so I strongly encourage you to write down a complete proof of Theorem 7.3. From Theorem 7.3, we directly obtain the following corollary. If the graph G is connected, then the matrix A tilde has linearly independent rows. A direct way to show corollary 7.1 is to look at the matrix B that we just constructed in the proof of theorem 7.3. From the structure of such a matrix, it's clear that its rows are linearly independent. Since B is a submatrix of A tilde with the same number of rows, it then follows that also A tilde has linearly independent rows. Similarly, we observe that the columns of B are linearly independent. Therefore, B is a basis matrix. Now remember that the columns of B are the columns of A tilde that correspond to the variables Fij with Ij in T. Now, since the remaining variables Fij with Ij not in T are all set to zero, then the flow vector that we have constructed is the basic solution corresponding to this basis. We have thereby shown that the tree solution is a basic solution. Similarly, a feasible tree solution is a basic feasible solution. Our theorem 7.4 states that the converse is also true. A flow vector is a basic solution if and only if it is a tree solution. In few slides we will be proving theorem 7.4. And to prove it we will need spanning trees. So let's start by defining what is a spanning tree. Let's say we have an undirected graph G equal to NE that is connected. And let E1 be a subset of the edges such that the graph NE1 is a tree. Then such a tree is called a spanning tree. So essentially a spanning tree is simply a tree whose node set coincides with the node set of the original graph and where its edge set is a subset of the edge set of the graph. In our picture here we have an example of a spanning tree. The graph that you see is the underlying graph and the thicker edges which are 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 1, 6, 2 and 6, 3 are the edges in E1. Another way of seeing this is that if you start from your original graph and remove all the edges that are not in E1, then you obtain a tree. The property of spanning trees that we need to prove our theorem 7.4 is stated in theorem 7.2. Let G equal to NE be a connected undirected graph and let E0 be some subset of the set E of edges. And we suppose that the edges in E0 do not form any cycles. We have an example of this situation in the picture below, where we have a graph together with the subset E0 of edges, which is formed by the thicker edges 1, 2, 2, 3, and 4, 6. Then our theorem says that the set E0 can be augmented to a set E1 so that n e1 is a spanning tree. In the example below, if you add 5, 6 and 6, 3, you see that you obtain a spanning tree. For this theorem, I'm gonna give you the idea of the proof, and I leave it to you to write down a complete proof. The idea is similar to the one that we used to prove theorem 7.1b. Namely, we select a cycle of g, and we remove from it an edge not in E0. In our example, a cycle is given by 1, 6, 5, 1. So for example, we remove 1, 6. Now we keep repeating this step. For example, we have the cycle 1, 2, 6, 5, 1. And we remove, for example, the edge 1, 5. Then we have the cycle 5, 4, 6, 5, and we remove the edge 4, 5. Then we look at the cycle 4, 3, 6, 4, and we remove the edge 4, 3. Finally, there is the cycle 6, 2, 3, 6, and we remove the edge 6, 2. At this point, in our example, we have no longer any cycle. By construction, the edges that are left contain E0. 
and we already know that removing one edge from a cycle keeps the graph connected. Therefore, we have obtained a tree. Since the node set is still n, because we never removed any node, we have obtained a spanning tree. The argument that I just gave you essentially shows to you that if you keep performing this operation, then you obtain a spanning tree with the desired property. However, we should make sure that such a step can always be performed. Namely, we need to show that given a cycle of G, such a cycle always contains at least one edge that is not in E0. The reason why this holds is that by assumption, E0 doesn't contain any cycles. So these are all the ingredients that you need to prove theorem 7.2. Now we are ready to prove theorem 7.4. In this theorem, we need to prove an if and only if, and we've already seen one of the two directions. We have seen in theorem 7.3 that a tree solution is a basic solution. So we only need to prove the reverse direction. Suppose now that F is a basic solution. We show that it is a tree solution. Now, to show that F is a tree solution, in particular, we need to find the associated tree. The idea is to look at all the arcs with Fij different from zero, and then extend this set to a spanning tree using theorem 7.2. We will see that F will be exactly the tree solution associated with such a spanning tree. So let's start by defining the set S of the arcs ij such that fij is different from zero. Now I claim that we only need to show that the arcs in S do not contain any cycle. Most of this proof will be devoted to proving that S doesn't contain any cycle. But before showing that, let me convince you that this is enough to conclude the proof of the theorem. So now let's assume that S indeed doesn't contain any cycle. In fact, by theorem 7.2, there exists a subset T of arcs containing S such that NT is a spanning tree. Now we can apply theorem 7.1 to obtain that the cardinality of T is equal to the number of nodes minus one. At this point, we're done. Since fij is equal to zero for every arc ij not in T, f is the tree solution associated with T. Great, so at this point I convinced you that to complete this proof we only need to show that the arcs in S do not contain any cycle. So let's change page and prove this statement. We show that the arcs in S do not contain any cycle.
we're going to show this statement by contradiction. So we assume for a contradiction. that S contains a cycle. Let's call this cycle C. So now how are we going to derive the contradiction? The idea is to look at the simple circulation associated with C that we always denote by HC. We will show that the constraints that are active at F are also active at the new flow F plus HC. This will then imply that F is not a basic solution, which then gives us a contradiction. So let HC be the simple circulation associated with C and consider the flow F plus HC. We said that we want to show that all constraints active at F are also active at F plus HC. Now there are two types of constraints that can be active. We have the equality constraints of the system AF equal to B and then the non-negativity constraints on the variables. So let's consider them separately and let's start by looking at the equality constraints. We have AF equal to B. By definition of basic solution. Therefore, all these equality constraints are active at F. And AHC is equal to zero, as we have seen when we discuss circulations. Therefore, A times F plus HC is equal to AF plus AHC equal to B. So we have shown that all these equality constraints are also active at F plus HC. Now let's consider the non-negativity constraints. If Fij is equal to zero, since the set C is contained in S, we have that the arc Ij does not belong to C. And we have Hijc equal to zero. Therefore, Fij plus Hijc is equal to zero plus zero, therefore zero. So also here, if a non-negativity constraint is active at F, then it is also active at F plus Hc. Thus, the constraints active at F do not have a unique solution. And F is not a basic solution. Here, in particular, I am using Theorem 2.2 and Definition 2.9 in Chapter 2. So we have obtained a contradiction. Hence, the arcs in S do not contain any cycle. 
As we have already discussed, this is the last thing we needed to prove this theorem. So this concludes the proof of the theorem. Now let's briefly summarize our conclusions so far. We've understood that basic solutions coincide with the three solutions, and that basic feasible solutions coincide with the feasible three solutions. We have also understood that every basis matrix is triangular, up to a reordering of rows and columns. Finally, given a basis matrix P, the vector of basic variables B inverse B tilde can be easily computed without the need to compute B inverse or to maintain B inverse in a tableau. As we have seen in general linear programming problems, we know very well that a basic feasible solution can be degenerate. In the setting of flows, this happens if the flow on some arc in T is equal to zero. In this case, we obtain that the same basic feasible solution may correspond to more than one tree. Let's see an example. On the left, we have our example of feasible tree solution that we saw a few slides ago. The basic feasible solution that we obtained is degenerate because f67 is equal to zero. In this case, there exists a different tree that yields the same basic feasible solution. And it is obtained by replacing the arc 67 by the arc 57 in the basis. I leave it as an exercise for you to check that this new tree leads to the same tree solution. At this point, we have understood very well how basic solutions and basic feasible solutions look like in our network flow problem. Now let's discuss a change of basis. First, let's recap how we perform a change of basis for a general linear programming problem. First, we choose a non-basic variable that enters the basis. Next, we compute the direction of motion. In other words, we find out how to adjust the basic variables in order to maintain the equality constraints. Finally, we increase the value of the entering variable until one of the old basic variables is about to become negative. Now let's interpret all these operations in our network. First, we need to understand what it means to pick a non-basic variable. A non-basic variable corresponds to an arc ij that doesn't belong to our tree t. We have a small example here on the right. This is just a part of the overall directed graph. And in bold, we have the arcs in the tree. Then our arc ij could be, for example, this one. We know very well that adding an arc that is not in the tree creates a unique cycle. In this example, the cycle has node sequence i, j, k, i, and associated arc sequence i, j, k, j, and i, k. Now let's start to modify our solution. In particular, we wish to increase the value of f, i, j from 0 to some positive value theta. When we increase the value of the variable f, i, j, we violate the flow conservation constraints on i and j. Therefore, in order to keep satisfying such flow conservation constraints, we need to modify the old basic variables. In this example, we need to decrease the value of fkl and the value of fik. Let's check that in our example, all the flow conservation constraints are still satisfied. Let's start with node i. Earlier on, I had three units of flow entering and three units of flow leaving. So the flow conservation constraint was satisfied. Now instead, I have three units of flow entering and the total amount of flow leaving i is theta plus three minus theta, therefore three, and the flow conservation constraints are still satisfied. For node k, we had two plus three units of flow entering and five units of flow leaving so the constraint was satisfied. Now we have 2 plus 3 minus theta units of flow entering and 5 minus theta units of flow leaving, so the flow conservation constraints are still satisfied. Then let's look at node j. Earlier on, I had 5 units of flow entering and 5 units of flow leaving. Now I have theta plus 5 minus theta units entering and 5 units leaving. 
So once again, the flow conservation constraints are still satisfied. Of course, all the flow conservation constraints in the remaining nodes are still satisfied because we made no change to any arc incident to them. Now that we've understood our little example, let's try to understand things more generally. The key is to use the unique cycle C, which by theorem 7.1d is formed by the arc ij together with some of the arcs in T. In our example, we've already seen this cycle and it has node sequence i, j, k, i, while the arc sequence is i, j, k, j, and i, k. In particular, I have constructed my cycle C so that the arc i, j is a forward arc. In this way, our flow change can be accomplished simply by pushing theta units of flow around the cycle. In fact, in our cycle, the arc i, j is forward, while the two arcs kj and ik are backwards. When we push theta units of flow around the cycle, we increase by theta the amount of flow on the forward arcs, and we decrease by theta the amount of flow on the backwards arcs. So our new flow, that we denote by f hat, is equal to f plus theta hc. If you want to write down explicitly the components of f hat, we have that f hat kl is equal to f kl plus theta if the arc kl is a forward arc in C. It is equal to f kl minus theta if kl is a backward arc in C. And it is equal to f kl for all the remaining arcs. Next, following the mechanics of our change of basis, we need to set theta as large as possible, provided that all arcs flow remain non negative. Now, if the set of backwards arcs is empty, then we can set theta star to be infinity, because we are not decreasing any component of f. So the flow will remain non-negative no matter how large the theta is. Otherwise, the largest possible value of theta is theta star, which is the minimum of f k l for all the arcs k l that are backwards. In our change of basis, then, a variable fkl that attains the minimum is set to zero and exits the basis. Getting back to our example, the minimum between 5 and 3 is equal to 3, therefore we set theta to be equal to 3. So now 5 minus 3 is equal to 2, 3 plus 0 is 3, and 3 minus 3 is equal to 0. So the variable fik becomes 0 and leaves the basis. On the contrary, the variable fij will enter the basis. And on the right, we see how our new flow looks like. In particular, you see that we have obtained a different tree. Now let's see a few possible change of basis in our example of tree solution that we have here on the slide. The arc 24 is not in the tree. Therefore, we could have f24 enter the basis. In this case, the cycle closed by the arc 24 as node sequence 2, 4, 3, 2. The forward arcs are 2, 4 and 4, 3, while the only backward arc is the arc 2, 3. Since there's only one backward arc, we have that f 2, 3 exits the basis, and theta star is equal to 2. Another arc that is not in the tree is the arc 1, 4. So we could have f 1, 4 enter the basis. In this case, the cycle closed with the tree as node sequence 1, 4, 3, 2, 1. In this cycle, the backward arcs are 1, 2 and 2, 3. They both have the same value of 2, therefore theta star is equal to 2, and either one of them can exit the basis. Another arc that is not in the tree is 4, 5. In this case, the cycle closed with the tree has node sequence 4, 5, 6, 8, 3, 4. So the backward arcs are 4, 3, 3, 8, and 8, 6. The one with the smallest flow is arc 8, 6. So f 8, 6 exits the basis and theta star is equal to 1. Finally, the only remaining arc that is not in the tree is 5, 7. So let's see what happens if f 5, 7 enters the basis. In this case, the cycle closed is 5, 7, 6, 5. 
so the backwards arcs are 5, 6 and 6, 7. The arc with the smallest flow is 6, 7 and its flow is equal to 0. So theta star is equal to 0 and f6, 7 exits the basis. Note that in this case we had a backwards arc with flow value equal to 0. Whenever this happens we have theta star equal to 0 and so the change of basis occurs without any change of the arc flows. Note that this can only happen if we start with a degenerate basic feasible solution. In fact, our arc with flow 0 is a backwards arc, and so in particular it must be an arc of the tree. Now we've understood how to perform a change of basis. Of course, we should perform only a change of basis when we improve the cost of the solution. So let's see how we can calculate the cost change. So let's say we start from our flow f and we construct the new flow f hat which is equal to f plus theta star hc. We already know that the cost change is theta star times c transposed hc. And when we discussed circulations we already computed c transposed hc which is equal to the sum of ckl for every kl forward minus the sum of ckl for every kl backwards. Recall that in our flow problem we are minimizing the cost of the flow. So our variable fij should enter the basis only if the cost change that we just computed is negative. Now theta star is always greater than or equal to zero, so the quantity that should be negative is the one inside the parentheses. This quantity of course is very easy to calculate. We only need to sum the costs of the forward arcs and subtract the cost of the backward arcs. When we develop the simplex method for general linear programming problems, when we discuss the cost change, we introduce reduced costs. So it makes sense to wonder how reduced costs can be interpreted in our network flow problem. Let's do that. In chapter 3, we understood that if the variable that enters the basis takes the value theta star, then the cost change is given by theta star times the reduced cost of the entering variable. So now we have two expressions for the same cost change. One is given by theta star times the reduced cost of the entering variable, and one is given by theta star times the quantity inside the parentheses over here. This immediately implies that the reduced cost of the entering variable is given by the quantity inside the parentheses over here which in turn coincides with C transposed HC. So let's write it down. We have that the reduced cost of arc IJ, C bar AJ, is equal to C transposed HC, which is then equal to the sum of CKL for every KL forward minus the sum of CKL for every KL backwards. So this is precisely the cost of the cycle around which the flow is being pushed. So at this point, we have fully understood how we can compute reduced costs. Next, I want to give you a different formula to compute the same reduced costs. The reason I'm going to do that is because this alternative way of computing reduced costs is more efficient. To obtain this formula, we now start from the definition of reduced costs. From chapter 3, C bar transpose is equal to C transpose minus C B transpose B inverse A tilde. If we define our dual vector as P transpose equal to C B transpose B inverse, we obtain equivalently that our reduced costs are C transpose minus P transpose A tilde. In this formula, of course, B is the current basis matrix and C B is the vector of the costs of the basic variables. From the definition of our dual vector P, we obtain that the dimension of P is equal to the number of rows of A tilde, which in our case is equal to n minus 1. And so we have a dual variable PI for every node I different from n. Now let's keep here the formula that we just obtained for the reduced costs. And consider now a single component of the reduced costs corresponding to an arc IJ. On the left hand, I simply obtain C bar IJ. On the right hand, the component IJ of C is simply C IJ. 
So I only need to figure out what is the component ij of p transpose a tilde. This is the inner product of p with the column of a tilde corresponding to ij. Now we know exactly how this column looks like. It has a plus 1 in row i and a minus 1 in row j. Of course, if i or j is equal to n, that component is not present. So now let's consider separately three cases for c bar ij depending on whether i and j are equal to n or no. If both i and j are different from n, from our formula above, we obtain that c bar ij is equal to cij minus pi minus pj. If j is equal to n, then c bar ij will be equal to cij minus pi. And finally, if i is equal to n, then c bar ij is equal to cij plus pj. Nobody likes to have a formula broken down in different cases. A nice way to avoid that is to set pn equal to 0 and define c bar ij equal to cij minus pi minus pj. And now this formula holds for every ij in a. Note that here I'm not setting to zero a component of my vector p, because my vector p only had n minus 1 components. In fact, I am only adding an auxiliary component that is set to zero. Great, so at this point I have obtained this formula at the top of the slide. So to calculate my reduced cost, I only need the cost vector and the vector p. So it only remains to compute the dual vector p associated with the current basis. We will now see that such a dual vector can be obtained from the equality constraints over here corresponding to the arcs ij in the tree. In fact, the arcs ij in the tree correspond to basic variables and the reduced cost must be equal to zero. So essentially, for those arcs, this quantity on the right hand is equal to zero. I simply write this down here. pi minus pj equal to cij for every ij in t. On top of that, we also know that pn is equal to zero, because we defined it in this way. In these new slides, I copied here my system of equality constraints. Everything we have to do now is to solve this system. We are going to use once again our visualization of our directed graph as hanging on the root, which we also used when we constructed the three solutions. However, while in that case we started from the leaves and went up towards the root, now we do the opposite and we start from the root. This is because we already know the component of p corresponding to the root, which is pn equal to zero. So now we need to go down the tree, towards the leaves. And at every step, we will evaluate a new component of p. So let's say that after a number of steps, we have evaluated pi for some node i. And let's say that below i, we have node j and k, with arcs ij and ki. What we need to do is to compute pj and pk. Let's start from pj. What we want to do is to use our equation for the arc ij in the tree. So, well, we have the same exact notation that we used here, so we obtain pi minus pj equal to cij. In this equation, we already know cij and pi, so we can calculate pj as pi minus cij. Then, to determine pk, we use our equation with the arc ki. So we obtain pk minus pi equal to cki. In this case, we know cki and pi, so we can calculate pk as pi plus cki. So essentially, to calculate the components of p of the nodes below i, we start from pi and subtract the cost of the arc if the arc is going down, or we add the cost of the arc if the arc is going up. At this point, we fully understood how the simplex algorithm simplifies for network flow problems. So let's put all the ingredients together and formally state the algorithm. 
So this is the simplex method for uncapacitated network flow problems. In a typical iteration, we start with a basic feasible solution F associated with the tree T. Next, we compute the dual vector P. To do so, we solve our system of equations over here by proceeding from the root towards the leaves. Then we compute the reduced costs for all arcs ij not in the tree. This can be done using this formula over here since we know the cost vector and the dual variables. If all the reduced costs are non-negative, the current basic feasible solution is optimal and the algorithm terminates. Otherwise, we choose some arc ij with a c bar ij strictly negative to be brought into the basis. Now the entering arc ij together with the arcs in t form a unique cycle. If all the arcs in the cycle are oriented the same way as ij, then the optimal cost is minus infinity and the algorithm terminates. So let's assume this is not the case. We let b be the set of arcs in the cycle that are oriented in the opposite direction from ij. We define theta star as the minimum of fkl for all the arcs kl in b. And we push theta star units of flow around the cycle. The new flow vector can be computed by adding theta star to all the arcs in f and by removing theta star to all the arcs in b. Finally, we remove from the basis one of the old basic variables whose new value is equal to zero. We are now ready to see an example. We consider the uncapacitated network flow problem shown in the figure. The input of an uncapacitated network flow problem consists in our directed graph, which is clear from the picture, the supplies, which as always we visualize with the double arrows, here and here, and finally, we're given the arc costs. In our picture, the costs are written next to the arcs. Now, please don't get confused. In fact, so far, the numbers next to the arcs always corresponded to the flow value of such an arc. So in this picture, the numbers are not flow values. Instead, they are the given arc costs. So now I copied my input problem over here. And instead, in the picture below, I will visualize my current solution. The way I visualize my current solution is by drawing only the arcs that are in the tree. And the number next to the arcs now are the value of the flow of the corresponding arc. So once again, don't get confused. In the top picture, the numbers next to the arc are the costs. And in the bottom picture, the numbers on the arcs are the flows. In particular, note that I don't need to write down the flows corresponding to the missing arcs because they are not in the tree, therefore their flow value is equal to zero. So let's look at the solution down below. I claim that this is a tree solution. It's immediate to verify that the arcs indeed form a spanning tree. The value of the flow outside the tree is equal to zero. So the only thing left to verify is that the flow conservation constraints are satisfied. For each of the nodes 1, 3 and 5, we have one unit of flow entering and one unit of flow leaving, while for the nodes 2 and 4, we have zero units of flow entering and zero units of flow leaving. Therefore, all the flow conservation constraints are satisfied and this is a tree solution. Also, it's greater than or equal to zero, therefore it is a feasible tree solution. Now we consider arc 43, which is not in our tree. Next, we want to compute the reduced cost of variable f43. We have seen two different ways to compute the reduced cost. I will compute it using the first method and I leave it to you as an exercise to compute it using the second method. In the first method, I need to look at the cycle formed by the new arc together with the tree. In this case, the cycle has node sequence 4, 3, 5, 4, and I choose this direction because in this way 4, 3 is forward. The reduced cost C bar 4, 3 is then equal to the cost of that cycle. 
which is defined as the sum of the costs of the forward arcs minus the sum of the costs of the backward arcs. Now 4.3 and 3.5 are forward, while 4.5 is backwards. So the cost of the cycle is C4.3 plus C3.5 minus C4.5. We can now read these costs in the picture above and we obtain 0 plus 0 minus 1. So the cost of the cycle is minus 1. This is great because we've already found a negative reduced cost. So we let the arc 4.3 enter the tree. Now theta star is the minimum of the flow values on the backwards arcs. The only backward arc is 4.5 and it has flow equal to 0. So theta star is equal to 0 and the arc 4.5 leaves the tree. Now in the picture below we have replaced the arc 4.5 with arc 4.3 in the tree. But the value of the flow didn't change because we had the theta star equal to 0. Once again, let's search for an arc not in the tree with negative reduced cost. One arc that is not in the tree is arc 1-2, so let's compute its reduced cost. If we add the arc 1-2 to our tree, we close the cycle with node sequence 1, 2, 4, 3, 1. So the forward arcs are 1-2, 2, 2 4, and 4, 3, and the only backwards arc is 1-3. So the reduced cost is 0 plus 0 plus 0 minus 1, which is equal to minus 1. This is negative, so we let the arc 1, 2 enter the tree. Now theta star is the minimum of the flows on the backwards arcs, so it is equal to 1. So now we need to push one unit of flow along the cycle. The flow on arcs 1, 2, 2, 4 and 4, 3 will increase by 1, and the flow on arc 1-3 will decrease by 1. Therefore, it will become 0 and the arc 1-3 leaves the tree. We obtain the new tree in the picture below. At this point, you can check that this is an optimal solution. How should you do that? Well, there are only two arcs that are not in the tree. These are arcs 4-5 and 1-3. You can check that both reduced costs are non-negative. So we have obtained an optimal solution. At this point, we have fully understood how we can perform a pivot in our simplex method for network flow problems. So the only thing left to understand is how we can obtain an initial basic feasible solution. First, let me point out that in many practical applications, often an initial basic feasible solution is available. And in that case, we can simply start our algorithm with such a solution. On the other hand, if an initial basic feasible solution is not available, then we can obtain it by solving an auxiliary problem. To construct this auxiliary problem, we introduce an auxiliary arc from each source to each sink. Here we have a picture that represents this situation. Let's say in our original graph we had three sources, 1, 2 and 3, and two sinks, 4 and 5. Then the auxiliary arcs that we introduce are the ones drawn here. Now with the addition of these arcs, finding a basic feasible solution is straightforward and I leave it as an exercise to you. Essentially you set the flow on every original arc to zero and so you only have to decide the flow for your auxiliary arcs. Now let's look at the first source and the first sink. And now look at the minimum among B1 and minus B4. Then you send this amount of flow from the source to the sink. It is immediate to see that now you have fulfilled all the supply in either the source or the sink. So essentially you can throw away this node and repeat this greedy construction on the remaining sources and sinks. As an exercise, you should write down this algorithm and show that the solution that you obtain is a basic feasible solution in your auxiliary problem. Now that you have such a solution, you set the cost of the auxiliary arcs to 1 and the cost of the original arcs to 0. Now you solve this auxiliary problem and it's easy to see that the optimal solution of the auxiliary problem that you obtain gives you a basic feasible solution of the original problem. In particular, since the auxiliary arcs have positive costs 
while the original arcs have zero cost, in the optimal solution of your auxiliary problem, there will be no flow on the auxiliary arcs. So at this point, we have found a basic feasible solution of the original problem. This was our goal, and now we can start improving our solution with our network simplex. Using this technique, we had to run twice our simplex method. Once to solve the auxiliary problem, and then again to solve the original problem. And this mirrors nicely what we did in the two-phase simplex method. However, for our network flow problem, there is a way of solving the problem by running only once the simplex method. Let's look again at our auxiliary problem, where we set to 1 the costs of the auxiliary arcs, and we set to 0 the costs of the original arcs. Now we still consider this auxiliary problem, but we change again the costs. We put back the original costs to the original arcs, and the costs of the auxiliary arcs are not set to 1, but they are set to some number that is very large. Now you can show that if this number is chosen large enough, then an optimal solution to the auxiliary problem will directly give you an optimal solution to the original problem. I leave this as an exercise to you. The first thing you should look into to solve this exercise is ask yourself how large should be the cost of an auxiliary arc in order for the solution to your auxiliary problem to have zero flow on the auxiliary arc. In fact, if the optimal solution to your auxiliary problem has zero flow on all the auxiliary arcs, then since in the original arcs you have the original costs, it is simple to show that you have indeed obtained an optimal solution to your original problem. It is clear from our discussion on the network simplex algorithm that this algorithm is similar to the naive implementation of the simplex method that we saw in chapter 3. However, there are some key differences. In particular, in chapter 3, in order to obtain the dual vector P, we needed to solve the system CB transposed equal to P transpose B. In chapter 3, the dual vector P was then obtained through our simplex tableau or by computing the matrix B inverse. Instead, for network flow problems, it was much easier for us to calculate the dual vector P. The way we did it was through our procedure where we set Pn equal to 0 and then we proceeded from the root towards the leaves, computing at every step a new component of P. In fact, to compute the dual vector P, for network flow problems we only need the big O of n computations using this method. In fact, we only need n steps because we only have n nodes and every step only requires a constant number of operations. Then, in our network simplex, we need to compute the reduced costs, and to do so we only need big O of M computations. This is simply because we need to compute M reduced costs, and each one requires only a constant number of computations, since we've already constructed the dual vector P. Finally, we need to perform the change of basis and this can be done only in O of n computations. In fact, even though the flow vector has m entries, during the change of basis, we only update the flow on a cycle in our directed graph. In a cycle, the number of arcs is equal to the number of nodes. Therefore, the length of the cycle is at most n. So we only need to update big O of n entries of our flow, and updating each one, requires only a constant number of computations. Since our directed graph is connected, we have that the number of arcs is at least n-1. Therefore, the total number of computations is big O of m. So we have shown that one pivot of the network simplex requires big O of m computations, which is much less than the big O of mn computations per pivot of the general simplex method that we saw in chapter 3. And this is why the network simplex is one order of magnitude faster than the general simplex method. Actually, the running time of the network simplex algorithm can be further improved in several different ways. For example, there is a faster way to obtain the dual variables, and there are specific data structures for this problem that allow you to perform fewer operations. 
Of course, all the theoretical results that we discussed in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 also apply for the network simplex method. In particular, in the absence of degeneracy, the algorithm always terminates in a finite number of steps. However, in the presence of degeneracy, the algorithm may cycle. Once again, cycling can be avoided either by using general-purpose anti-cycling rules, like those that we have seen in Chapter 3, or also special methods which have been developed ad hoc for this problem. One interesting thing to notice is that if the optimal cost is minus infinity, then our network simplex terminates with a negative cost directed cycle. In fact, the reason why you can obtain solutions with cost arbitrarily small is because you have this negative cost directed cycle, and so the more flow you push around the cycle, the lower your objective value will be. On the other hand, if the optimal cost is finite, then the algorithm terminates with an optimal flow vector f and an optimal dual vector p. Regarding the total number of iterations, like for the general simplex, the number of iterations is often big O of m, but also in this case there exist examples where the simplex is forced to perform an exponential number of change of basis. Next, we discuss under which conditions our network flow problem has integral optimal solutions. We consider network flow problems where the problem data are integer. For these problems, most of the quantities that we calculate in the simplex method are also integer, and so the whole simplex method can be implemented using integer arithmetic. This has several advantages. In particular, we have a faster computation, and we don't have to deal with any issue of a finite precision or truncation errors. The next theorem tells us everything we need to know about integral optimal solutions. Consider a non-capacitated network flow problem and assume that the underlying graph is connected. A. For every basis matrix B, the matrix B inverse has integer entries. B. If the supplies Bi are integer, then every basic solution has integer coordinates. C. If the cost coefficients are integer, then every dual basic solution has integer coordinates. In particular, note that A holds for every uncapacitated network flow problem. On the other hand, in B we assume that the supplies are integer, and in C we assume that the costs are integer. Now let's see how we can show theorem 7.5. Let's start by proving A. Essentially, the proof of A follows from the structure of the basis matrix B that we saw in the proof of theorem 7.3. In that proof, we saw that we can reorder the rows and the columns of B so that it becomes lower triangular and its diagonal entries are either 1 or minus 1. This directly implies that the determinant of B is equal to 1 or minus 1. Now, if you apply Kramer's rule to compute B inverse, you immediately see that B inverse has integer entries. This is because, by Kramer's rule, every entry of B inverse is equal to a subdeterminant of the matrix B divided by the determinant of B. Now B is integral, therefore every subdeterminant is integral, and the determinant of B is 1 or minus 1, so the ratio will be an integral number. Next, let's prove B. There are at least two very simple ways to prove B. The first is to look at the formula that determines the basic components of the flow. We know that Ft is equal to B inverse B tilde. We have just seen that B inverse is integral, and we're now assuming that the supplies are integer, therefore B tilde is integral as well. The product then will be integral. Another way to prove B is to look at the algorithm that determines the values of the basic variables. This is the algorithm where we first looked at the leaves of our tree and we proceeded towards the root. At every step, we determine the flow of a new arc and it is obtained by adding and subtracting only supplies and flows that we have already computed. Therefore, all the flows that you will compute will be integer numbers. Finally, let's prove C. Also in this case, we can prove it in two different ways. The first is to look at the formula that determines the dual basic solution P. This is P transpose equal to CB transpose B inverse. Once again, in A we have shown that B inverse is integral, 
and now we are assuming that the vector c is integral. Therefore, the product will be integral as well. The other way of showing c is to look at the algorithm that determines the values of the dual variables. This is the algorithm where we started from the root and proceeded towards the leaves. At every step, we determine a new component of the dual vector p, and it is obtained as a sum and difference of components of p that you've already calculated and of components of the cost vector c. So now we have completed the proof of theorem 7.5. From this theorem, we directly obtain a corollary 7.2. Consider an uncapacitated network flow problem and assume that the optimal cost is finite. A. If all supplies are integer, there exists an integer optimal flow vector. And B. If all cost coefficients are integer, there exists an integer optimal solution to the dual problem. The network flow problem has a number of special cases of particular interest. Let's see a few of them. The first one is the maximum flow problem. In the maximum flow problem, we have a directed graph, we are given a source node S and a sink node T, and we are also given arc capacities Uij. Our task is to determine the largest possible amount of flow that can be sent from the source to the sink without exceeding the arc capacities. This problem can be formulated as a network flow problem. To do so, we set the supply of each node to zero and the cost of each arc to zero. Then we add a new arc from T to S. This arc has cost minus one and capacity plus infinity. Now, if you solve the network flow problem that we have just defined and then throw away the component corresponding to the arc TS, you obtain an optimal solution to your original maximum flow problem. Exercise, prove it. The next special case is the shortest path problem. In this problem, we are given a directed graph, an origin node, and a destination node. We are also given arc costs. Our task is to find a shortest path, which is a directed path from the origin to the destination, whose length is smallest. Here, the length of the path is defined as the sum of the costs of all the arcs on the path. This problem can be formulated as a network flow problem, provided that there are no directed cycles of negative length. In such a case, to formulate the shortest path problem as a network flow problem, we set the supply of the origin to be equal to 1, the supply of the destination equal to minus 1, and 0 for any other node. We keep the given arc costs and we set all capacities to infinity. Also here, it's a very good exercise for you to prove that the network flow problem that we defined yields an optimal solution to the shortest path problem. Note that the assumption that there are no directed cycles of negative length is definitely required, because if there is a directed cycle of negative length, then the network flow problem can be unbounded. On the other hand, the shortest path problem is clearly always a bounded problem, because there are only finitely many possible solutions. Next, we discuss the transportation problem. Here we have m suppliers and n consumers. For every supply i, we are given the corresponding supply si. For every consumer j, we are given the corresponding demand dj. We also assume that the sum of all the supplies is equal to the sum of all the demands. For every pair of supplier and consumer, we are given the corresponding unit cost of transporting one unit of good from the supplier to the consumer. Therefore, in our directed graph, we only have the nodes corresponding to the suppliers and to the consumers. And we have all the arcs from every supplier to every consumer. Our goal is then to transport the goods from the suppliers to the consumers at minimum cost. For the transportation problem, I don't need to explain to you how you can formulate it as an uncapacitated network flow problem. In fact, the transportation problem clearly is just a special case of the more general uncapacitated network flow problem that we studied.
Now the interesting thing is that essentially we don't lose any generality in studying the transportation problem instead. Formally, every network flow problem can be transformed into an equivalent transportation problem. In particular, this implies that any algorithm for the transportation problem can be adapted to solve the general network flow problem. For this reason, if your goal is to develop a new algorithm for network flow problems, you should first develop and test your algorithm on transportation problems, and then extend it to the more general setting of network flow problems. Finally, let's look at a problem that we've seen already in our very first lecture. This is the assignment problem. The assignment problem is a special case of the transportation problem that we have just seen. It is even more special because the number of suppliers is equal to the number of consumers. Furthermore, each supplier has unit supply and each consumer has unit demand. It can be shown that due to this very special structure, one can always find an optimal solution where the value of the flow is either 0 or 1 on every arc. Now, if you look at the arcs with flow equal to 1 in such an optimal solution, each arc will assign a supplier to a consumer, and this justifies the name of this problem. And with this very special case of the network flow problem, we conclude our video on the network simplex algorithm.